The RBA's Unemployment Predictions. Let's have a look. Hello everyone, Florian Heiser here and welcome to another episode of Heiser Says. I have my Stein of Coffee and I thought we'd have a look at this article from news.com.au by Jason Murphy. In it he's discussing the RBA's bleak predictions for Aussie jobs. Now, a chart that I show off all the time is this one here. Now, what it's to do with is the RBA's wage price index forecast and their fantastic ability at predicting the future. What do you reckon, guys? I'm sure next time, maybe 2020, they'll be right. They'll have to be right. But before we go through this article, let's just have a look at two things. This is from the ABS, and this is their labor force, you know, Australia for April data. We can see here the number of employed people has plummeted. It has plummeted, seasonally adjusted. They're saying the unemployment rate has skyrocketed over or about 6.2%. Okay, and increased 1 point to 6.2. Now, this is the ABS. Now, we have an alternative data source, and this is Ray, oh, sorry, Roy Morgan. And they've got their underemployment and unemployment estimates. And we go right down to the bottom. You can see here, they estimate unemployment at 15.3%. And under Frederick... So they estimate unemployment is at 15.3%, where underemployment is at 94 So there's a difference here, because there's a different methodology in what they do. One of the things you have to realize, with the survey that they do, there's a particular window and time period that they do it. And I'll go through this in greater detail here, but I just want to highlight this little chart here for you. So yesterday was the 14th of May, and they released the April data. And when was the April data taken? The reference weeks in the April data was collected from the 29th of March to the 11th of April. So over a month ago. It's not this May data they've just collected. No, they need a month to process this data, which frankly seems utterly insane. You think they'd have better methods in place to allow them to process the data. Um, it's ABS, aren't they meant to be the experts on it? Maybe they've got a cross check and I guess they are doing interviews. So the information we're looking at is already a month out of date and the methodology is different. If you are not working, but you are not looking for work, like you'd be on perhaps JobKeeper, you're not technically considered unemployed. So when we add the JobKeeper numbers to this, it's going to look much, much worse. That's why I'd suggest that JobKeeper is maybe, maybe put in place primarily to make these numbers appear better. So you just have to be aware of you know, different data sources, different approaches to measuring things, and where the data is coming from. Whenever they discuss these things, when they make economic decisions, a lot of it is on outdated data. And a month to process information, when you can get real-time data from <laughs> all these other sources, seems a bit antiquated, doesn't it? it really does. So let's get back. With that in hand, let's get back and have a look at this article written by Jason. So, the Reserve Bank has released its three options for Australian unemployment and even the best case scenario leaves a million out of work. So considering their, their stellar record with, with predicting wage growth, are they going to be better at predicting unemployment? Today is a tough day. For Australia. Terribly shocking, as Prime Minister Scott Morrison said in a press conference this morning shortly after the Australian Bureau of Statistics released its latest unemployment figures. How is it shocking? If you ascend, you're locking down the entire economy, how is it shocking? It seems to make perfect sense. How is this? This can't be shocking. Shocking as if you know, you're surprised. It's unexpected. So far, almost 600,000 Australians have lost their jobs, bumping the unemployment rate up one full percentage point from 5.2% to 6.2. But what's to come is far, far more bleak. Last week, the Reserve Bank mapped out three possible outcomes for the future of jobs in Australia. It modelled a baseline scenario, an upside scenario, and a downside scenario. None of the scenarios are good, as the next graph shows. Now, here's something to think about whenever we're, see we're showing these forecasts. Often they'll say a worst case scenario, or they'll say, you know, baseline scenario or downside scenario. Now, 
are these three, and here's a question I have to you, because the same thing's coming from Commonwealth Bank with their housing pool predictions. Are these three indicative of, of likelihood of happening? Because they, they never seem to say, you know, just because this is, you know, the downside, the worst case scenario doesn't mean its likelihood is the lowest. It means it has the worst impact. Baseline, does that mean its likelihood is the average? Or does that mean it's likely it's just to do the average impact? That's the question I put to you. I, you know, intuitively, we'd think downside is the least likely and upside is the least likely. And the middle is the most likely. But I have never seen that articulated anywhere. Maybe I need to look a bit further. Maybe someone can help me in the comments. But that's just, just something interesting, isn't it? The upside. Even the upside scenario has a million people out of work and unemployment peaking over 10%. But in this upside scenario, the bad times don't last. The labor market heals quickly and is back to its current level within about two years. Is two years quick, everyone? That seems like a, quite a long time. Quite a long time. The assumption is that we beat the pandemic and people get their confidence back. Um, but what about international trade, international tourism, demand for housing? The fact that this is going to have a change on consumer spending habits, the businesses that won't come back. Because of the better health outcomes and policy stimulus in place, the rebound in consumer demand and reduced uncertainty about the outlook would allow businesses to rehire workers and resume investment plans quickly, the RBA said while describing the upside scenario. What do you think, everyone? Do you think that's going to happen? I, I'm probably too cynical to, to even see that happening. I think businesses are going to be very, very cautious. They're going to be very cautious. You'll be insane to take on debt right now for ongoing expenses when you aren't even sure if your business is going to be viable. And I, I, the retail sector is going to hit it more than anyone. And they're a huge employer in, this, in our country, guys, a huge employer. How many people's spending habits are going to change now they've gotten used to online purchasing? Well, I can tell you now, and this is completely unscientific anecdotal evidence. If my mother can manage to order something online, then retail's dead. She told me yesterday she went for another half hour drive to find vacuum cleaner bags. If I can get her to order something online, then our retail is really in real in trouble. So I think it's probably still safe for a while because people also like the experience. But that doesn't mean they're going to be spending as rec recklessly as they have in the past. So the baseline, we shouldn't expect the upside scenario. The R RBA thinks a more realistic scenario is that unemployment is still over 6% in two years time. This is their baseline, the outcome they think is most likely. Okay, good. So baseline is the highest probability of occurring. Fantastic. I'm glad I'm seeing it somewhere. But the baseline is still a fast recovery by historical standards. It usually takes many years of unemployment to recover from a recession, as the next graph shows. And we can see here, I mean, there you go. There's June 83. There's the, the recession Australia had to have. In the 80s recession, it took two years for unemployment to peak and another six years to recover. In the 90s recession, it took three years to peak and eight years to recover. I'd be more interested in seeing the data from the Great Depression. The RBA expects this time to be different because the downturn has been driven by health-related restrictions, not economic factors. Why? Are they hoping that? Well, I guess they don't believe there's underlying issues with our economy, dependent on foreign nations for a lot of our exports. A very primitive economy that's not exporting advanced things, that has to manufacture a lot of, well, has to bring in a lot of things manufactured overseas. A property bubble that's been pushed on since 2000. So that's somewhat fair, assuming the pandemic doesn't come back. Once lockdowns are done, we can return to our usual economic lives, working and spending. There's reason to hope that some parts of the economy can snap back. That, this is why Treasurer Josh Frydenberg was talking about on Tuesday. Treasury estimates that the benefits of just stage one being lifted will lead to more than 250,000 people going back to work and more than 3 billion in additional GDP, he said. Another little bonus for the speed of the recovery, jobs lost were mostly in businesses with high turnover of staff, like hospitality. It's quick to rehire 10,000 bar staff and waiters than it is to hire 10,000 qualified tradies or nurses. And the downside, 
The downside scenario is much gloomier than the baseline. In this scenario, we spent a full year with unemployment over 10%. That drags out the recovery. By 2022, unemployment is still higher than it was a few months ago, well over 7%. That means looking for a job would be very hard for a very long time. One of the problems in the downside scenario is even people who do have jobs are forced to take one that doesn't suit their skills, such as driving for Uber. That's an example of what the RBA calls a poor match. The longer the economy remains weak, the more employment relationships are severed and the more households and firms will suffer severe financial stress. This would slow the recovery further and increase the chance that workers need to take jobs that are poor matches for their skills, the RBA said. The downside scenario will come true, the RBA reckons, if travel restrictions are in place until next year. Aren't there articles coming out that international travel will be restricted till 2023, perhaps? Tourism, everyone, is a $60 billion industry in Australia. It's going to take a hit. If we need to go back to restrictions due to a second wave, or if households and business confidence remains low, well, yeah, look at business confidence, guys, and just look at consumer confidence. Any or all of which seem quite plausible. The RBA's downside scenario seems gloomy, but is their bad scenario bad enough? After all, it still has unemployment falling swiftly in 2021, and it assumes international travel restrictions will be lifted by 2021. This might not be. Yes, it may not be. Australia is a medium-sized trading nation, and as such, we depend a lot on the rest of the world, especially the US. The US is doing everything wrong in managing the pandemic. If there is going to be a big second wave of infections anywhere, it will be in America. That will slow down growth in the world's biggest economy, and inevitably, it will have an effect on Australia. Another big consequence of the pandemic seems to be worsening relations with China. On Tuesday, China put a ban on imports of beef from four Australian abattoirs. And that's just a warning shot from them about what could come next. We've got another video where we look at just the impact of coal. Without, uh, sorry, the impact on iron ore. Without China, the chances of Australia's economy returning to previous highs seems remote. Well, that's the thing. China helped us in the GFC because they stimulated their economy and that increased the demand for a lot of Australia's products. There's also the possibility of a big downturn in Australian real estate. Residential vacancies in Sydney CBD have risen, risen from 6.5% a year ago to 13.8% in April. Commercial landlords are in even worse position, with retail and office space suddenly looking, like, uh, looking very much in surplus. And that's going to be, you know, as people return to work. Uh, one gentleman I was talking to, a viewer, He's working for a client and they're cutting the floor plate, what, like 60 or 80%, some insane amount for a large, big commercial tenant from 20,000 square meters to four. Just think about that, everyone. If that happens more and more, what will happen for the demand of high-end and commercial property in the city? The RBA likes to make, make its forecast symmetrical where the downside and the upside are balanced, but the pandemic is like the butterfly effect. Consequences will spiral out in ways that are very hard to predict. This means that while the best case scenario is just to return to boring old normal, the worst downside scenario is not just the mirror image of that, it's much worse. So there we have it guys. John Murphy's or Jason Murphy's look at the forecast from the RBA. I think the downside risk or the incre you know, the very bad downside risk is probably heading up there. What do you all think, everyone? What do you all think? Which one do you think is more likely? As always, let me know your thoughts and opinions in the comments below. Thank you all for watching. Please like, share, and subscribe to the channel. If you're a fan and you want to support us, there are a few ways you can. You can join the channel on YouTube. You can support us via our, our affiliate links at Amazon or eBay or Independent Reserve and KuCoin. You can use Gold Pass from the Perth Mint, buy a merch from Heiser Says, or support us via PayPal. Thanks, everyone. I'll see you next time.